Christ is risen and he's about to die. If you can hear the strangeness of those two st statements made back to back, then you're in good company because I am right there with you. But here we are in the Easter season and we find ourselves traveling backward in John's gospel to the Last Supper. Jesus' final moments with his disciples before he is arrested and killed. And I have to admit that if I was the one in charge of choosing scriptures for the lectionary cycle, I don't know that I would have chosen this particular passage from John 14 for the gospel reading for the fifth Sunday of Easter. But here it is. In the middle of our Easter joy and celebration of the risen Christ, we have a passage of scripture that looks ahead to his death. A conversation between Jesus and his disciples that begins with these words of assurance, do not let your hearts be troubled. And of course, Jesus' disciples have every reason to be troubled. They are gathered with Jesus to celebrate the Passover meal. Earlier in the evening, he washed their feet. He explained that in a little while, he would leave them. He declared that Judas would betray him and that Peter would deny him. His disciples don't understand that Jesus will die and be raised from the dead. And so they don't know how to make sense of what he has told them. They are anxious and maybe even a little afraid. If Jesus is leaving them, what does that mean for them? These men who have spent the last three years of their lives with him, what are they supposed to do without him? This is why Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. The words that follow the text of today's gospel reading are meant to give comfort and hope. It's a summary of Jesus' mission and why this is good news for them. Jesus is leaving them, yes, but he's doing so for a good reason. He has a job to do. He will die and be raised and ascend into heaven where he will be seated at the right hand of the Father. And he isn't leaving them to fend for themselves. Even in his absence, he will be thinking of them and preparing a place for them. And he asks for their trust because he has come on behalf of the Father and he is going back to the Father. This exchange between Jesus and his disciples is a part of his farewell discourse, his final words of instruction before his death. In today's gospel reading, there are two statements that really stand out, I think in part because they are familiar ones for many of us. And as we think about what it is that Jesus is telling his disciples in their final hours together, I want to spend some time reflecting on these two statements. The first is from verse 2. My father's house has many dwelling places. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And the second from verse 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Chances are, if you've been in Christian settings for very long, you have heard these verses quoted or referenced in songs or even memorized them yourself. But if you've only ever heard them in isolation... You may be surprised to find out that they are from the same passage of Scripture, this one. They are words spoken by Jesus to his disciples at the Last Supper. Verse 2 is probably best known as a funeral scripture. My father's house has many dwelling places. Some translations listed as mansions or rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? Some of us here today heard these very words yesterday as we honored the life of our dear sister Biba. Biba handpicked most of the scriptures for her memorial service, including the gospel reading. She chose John 14, 1 to 7, a slightly shortened version of today's gospel reading. Yesterday, as Pastor Barb read those words from John 14 and shared about Biba's life, about her trust in the goodness of God, Receiving those words was an exercise in hope. The Father's house has many rooms. Christ has gone to prepare a place for us, for you, for me, for Biba. And now Biba is in the presence of Christ. Even as we grieve, we trust, like Biba did, that death is not the end. The thing about verses that are lifted from their original context, though, is that they sometimes have the tendency to take on a life of their own. Jesus' promise of a house with many rooms isn't just quoted as words of comfort and hope at a funeral. 
in so many Christian spaces, these words are quoted to promote a theology of escapism, a theology that states, one day I'll fly away to glory and receive my reward in heaven, a mansion and a crown, and leave behind this terrible wor world for good. Good riddance. The focus here isn't so much on being present with God, it's on the belief that a room in God's house translates to a mansion in heaven. A cosmic motivator to serve God in this life so we can have a prize in the next. It's transactional. Likewise, when John 14, 6 is quoted, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's a chance that stripped from their context, these words have often been interpreted in a different way than they are used here in John 14. All too often, John 14, 6 is used as a theology of exclusivity. If no one comes to the Father except through Jesus, you better believe in Jesus or else. Without proper context for these words, so many followers of Jesus have used them in service of a kind of Christian triumphalism in which we pat ourselves on the back for possessing unique access to salvation. Through this lens, these words, no one comes to the Father except through me, become a warning or a threat. A litmus test of who's in and who's out. These two verses from John 14.2 and 14.6 get quoted and referenced so much because they are important. They tell us something about who Christ is and what he has come to do. The problem isn't with the verses themselves, it's that our understanding of them is sometimes shallow. But when we hear them in their proper context, when we examine them alongside Jesus' other words to his disciples on this night, and consider where Jesus and his disciples are and what's about to happen, we can make sense of these verses in their proper place. Taken together, these two statements serve as a key to this entire passage. And here is what they have to tell us. We have a home with God, and Christ is the one who makes this possible. When I was younger, growing up, if you had asked me where home was, I would have really struggled to answer that question. My family moved around a lot, uh, largely because of my dad's job as a free Methodist pastor, and itinerancy was a big part of that job. Was home Cincinnati, Ohio, where I was born? Was it Michigan, the place where I had my earliest childhood memories and many of my relatives lived? Was it Western New York, the place where I went to high school and went to college? Or was home where I happened to be living at the time? I didn't grow up in a childhood home. I lived in parsonages, many different parsonages. You know those TV shows or movies where an adult goes back to visit their parents' house and they stay in their childhood bedroom and it's a shrine to the past, all their posters are up on the wall and their old rickety twin bed is still there. It's too small for them. And they have their football jerseys and their dance trophies all lined up. I cannot relate to this scenario at all. And if I'm honest, I was always a little bit jealous of my friends who lived in the same house for their entire life. This place that contained all of their childhood memories and milestones because I didn't have that. So if I thought about it long enough, this question of home, what is home, where is home, I would have answered that home was wherever my parents were. I didn't particularly like moving. I was painfully shy as a kid and a teenager, and so it was hard to move. It was hard to constantly be the new kid at school. It was hard to make new friends and get used to new places. My parents were my one true constant. They gave me and my siblings a sense of safety and security. I knew that as long as I was with them, I was okay. I was home. So for me, home wasn't so much a place as it was a person or people. And this is, I think, what Jesus is getting at when he speaks of the Father's house with many rooms, not grand Mick mansions in heaven built on streets of gold, not a pie-in-the-sky theology. When he speaks of the Father's house, Jesus is speaking of God's dwelling place. Throughout the Old Testament, God's house or dwelling place sometimes refers to the tabernacle or the temple. Sometimes it's used to speak of all of creation. And in John's gospel, God's dwelling place is a person. 
the word made flesh, Jesus Christ. God's dwelling place, then, is anywhere where God's presence is made manifest. Howard Snyder helpfully explains it this way. God's house or dwelling place is wherever God is and wherever God's presence is made evident and God's will is done. Jesus' central meaning is this. There is plenty of room with God. We have a home with God. I don't think Jesus uses imagery of a house because he's communicating something about the location. This isn't about a literal house in heaven. He's giving us a picture of what it looks like to belong to God. God's house is big with room for everyone. God's posture is one of welcome and hospitality. And Christ is the one who has gone to prepare a place for us, like a host who makes the beds and wash, washes the dishes and sweeps the floors and prepares this big feast to welcome his guests. God has made a place for us. This is good news for those of us who grieve. Those who wonder if death is the end or if the promise of eternal life is real and true. It's good news for those who struggle to feel a sense of belonging. Those who lack stability and constancy. It's good news for those who don't feel safe or loved in their own home. Those whose family relationships are fragile or broken. It's good news for those who struggle to believe that God would love them and accept them, those who don't feel worthy of a place. It's good news for 11 scared disciples who are about to lose their friend, their teacher, and they don't understand why or where he's going. And it's good news for us, those of us who are trying our best to follow Jesus in a world that is all too often overwhelming and bewildering and heartbreaking. God's love is expansive, and God's welcome is wide. And one day in the new creation, when heaven and earth are joined, we will experience the fullness of God's presence for ourselves. We have a home with God, and Christ is the one who makes this possible. Thomas says out loud what the rest of the disciples are undoubtedly thinking when he says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? The disciples want a road map, clear instructions to a destination. They're not wondering who gets to go to God. That's not the question that's being asked here. It's a question of how they will get to where they need to go. They are afraid that without their teacher and friend, they will lose their way. So when Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is not intended to be a doctrine of exclusion about the scope of salvation. This is, as Elizabeth Meyer so beautifully puts it, a doctrine of consolation about Jesus' presence. As if to say, fear not, for as long as you are going to God, you'll be with me, walking beside me and in me and through me, for I am the way. In other words, don't worry about getting lost because if you're trying to get to the Father and you know me, I am all you need. As Christ declares to his disciples, we know the Father because we have seen the Son. Christ is the one who reveals the Father, who shows us who the Father is. And Christ is the one who has made it possible for God's creation to be redeemed and reconciled to God. This is why we read these words from Jesus' farewell discourse and dwell on his death even in the season of Easter. Because this is why Christ has come. Through his life and death and resurrection, Christ has conquered sin and death. The way, the truth, and the life. He makes our salvation possible. He shows us the very character and nature of God. And he offers us life abundant he abides in us as we abide in him. Which means this promise of life isn't just for the future, it's for right now. In God's house, there are many dwelling places, and this means that we are called to invite others into this space of belonging. Don't get caught up in the myth of scarcity. In God's house, there is room for all. Your own belovedness is not threatened by the belonging of others, and you don't have to prove anything to be invited. 
in God's house, there is room for all. The good news is for us. It's for our families, for our friends, and even for our enemies. In God's house, there is room for all. Christ, the one whose body is broken and whose blood is poured out for us, has gone to prepare a place for us. And even now, Christ dwells with us and in us, revealing the God who is love. In life and in death, we belong to him. He is our home. Amen.